Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? What is? Okay, good. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. It's, uh, I've been here uh, doing research at times at the Houdini Library, and it's, it's, it's nothing like it. So it's, a, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, Punch and Judy is somewhat of an esoteric subject matter here in America, and I could uh, talk about it for hours. And if anybody has it, their doubts, just ask my poor wife, okay? <laughs> yeah. Now, a few important things, uh, some homework first. Um, we have a, trend, a tremendous amount of uh, information to cover. And in order to keep things interesting and to moving along, I need to compress tons of information into an allotted time slot. So if there are any questions, I would just say speak to me at the very end of the program, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that. So exactly what is Punch and Judy? In its simplest form, uh, Punch is a nonsensical slapstick comedy puppet show about a misfit family. Think in terms of the cartoon show The Simpsons. But in our case, however, it's Marge, Homer, Bart, and Lisa Simpson meet Tom and Jerry in the Three Stooges. <laughs> Much like the movie Napoleon Dynamite, the show has no plot. <laughs> but somehow, it still works. While the show itself has a very loose structure, no two Punch and Judy shows are the same. And much, like, and much of the play is left to the imagination of the showman. And that's what makes it both interesting and fun. You can still see versions of the puppet show performed in countries around the world. I'm kind of new at this, uh, let's see here, let me just try this. There we go, okay. And here it is, uh, some great examples of that. Uh, what is not shown here is in Russia, Punch is known as Petruska. In Germany, it's Caspel. France, it's Polichinella. Uh, Italy, it's Pulsinella. And of course, here in the US and England, it's known as Punch. So the $64,000 question is, how did one of the oldest folk dramas begin? It took several hundred years for the dramatis persona to emerge and evolve into the puppet show it is today. There we go. For this lecture, though, we're going to begin at about the middle of the 16th century with a character known as Pulsinella. He was just one of many comical stock characters uh, appearing in a repertoire of plays put on by a group of actors known as the Commedia dell'arte, the theater of skills. Pulsinella had a large nose, he wore a floppy white costume with a pointed hat, and although he was witty uh, back then, he was somewhat of an idiot and a coward. Now, over the years, this traveling group of minstrels toured uh, the surrounding areas presenting their plays, and so popular was the character that the puppeteers of the day added him to their puppet shows. And so it was just a matter of time before they traveled throughout Europe. And we know that one of these shows was seen in England on May 9th of 1662. Was anybody there to see that? I'll just check. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the reason we know that is there was a man named, that's right, Samuel Pepys. He was a government minister, he kept a diary, and in his journal he noted uh, that he had been at an alehouse in Covent Garden, and he was there looking at a painting. And as he came out, he noticed this uh, pretty Italian puppet play, Pulsanella. Now, it wasn't a, a puppet show per se, but it was a puppet play. And he was so taken by the performance that he told his, uh, his wife and his servants to go see it. The name of the performer was Pietro Gimonde, and because he was from Bologna, which is in northern Italy, he was called Signor Bologna. Makes sense to me. Okay. He was traveling through, throughout Europe, and he happened to make a stop in England where he stayed for many months. And everywhere he went, the show was noted for its chief character, a hook-nosed clown with a black half-mask and a squeaky voice. In October of that year, Signor Bologna gave a royal performance, a command performance, for King Charles II, and the monarch was so impressed with him that he gave him a gold chain and a medal as a way of showing his appreciation. I'll try to get this here. Boop, there we go. Okay. This is uh, Martin Powell. This is about 1709, and that's Punch, uh, it's, yeah, Punch and Mrs. Punch. Now, I should point out that the puppet shows at that particular time, they were marionettes. That's puppets with strings. And several puppeteers were uh, needed in order to present these shows on these large makeshift stages. 
Each puppet was probably about three feet high. Other Italian performers heard of Bologna's success, and before long they headed to England, where the popularity of the, of the marionette was rapidly being established. Now, many of the shows started working large fairs, such as Bartholomew uh, Fair, Norwich, and all over England. The shows, however, were a bit tacky. You had to go into a marquee and stand in the dark. And there were prostitutes, pickpockets, and all sort of things going on in the darkness. And during the next hundred years, the people of England grappled with the name of this character. And eventually his name was shortened from Pulcinella to Punchinello, and eventually to Punch. Other characters began to emerge. One of the earliest characters was the devil, who fought Mr. Punch at the very end of the story. By the 1700s, Mr. Punch's wife was introduced to the show, and at that time her name was Joan. And because it was pronounced through a swazzle, that's a little device that the performer puts in his mouth that gives Punch this squeaky voice. But when he would call her name, he would call Joan, but he would call her Joni. And people heard that and thought he was saying Judy. So eventually that's how it became known as Punch and Judy. Now as time passed by, these marionette shows started to play themselves out. One of the main reasons was that uh, the overhead costs. Some of the marionette shows required four or more entertainers to erect a large puppet theater and perform the show. That's a lot of people to feed, uh, especially when you're busking, which means you're working for tips. All oh, right, yeah. About 1779, Punch evolved into a hand puppet, which was much more viable than the old marionette shows. One man could now operate the puppets behind this portable stage, and his, it's, although it's not shown here, but in, in many instances, uh, his partner would stand um, in front of the puppet theater, he'd bang a drum, and play pan pipes in order to attract a crowd so they could collect money. It was a very short show. If you look at this copper engraving, you'll notice how tall the puppet stage is compared to some of the other people standing uh, near it. Uh, what you don't see is behind the curtain, the performer's holding the puppets above his head, and that was so that people could see it from a greater distance. Now, all the action took place on a small puppet stage, and oftentimes the puppets collided when they came together. Since Punch was a hand puppet, he can now pick up a stick and belabor anyone who stopped him from having his own way. That meant the law, his wife, the devil. No doubt one day the wooden baby puppet fell off the stage, it got a laugh, and other performers of the day added it to their show. <coughs> Punch's costume was originally all white, but through the years he acquired the red, yellow, and green motley colors of the Elizabethan jester. Lots of English puns and sense of humor began creeping into the show. Soon it became a very funny puppet play. Punch would ridicule people in high places, deflate the pompous, and to some people at the time, he was on their side. And in a day when they would hang you for stealing a loaf of bread, when Mr. Punch was confronted by the hangman, Jack Ketch, and Punch tricked the hangman into putting his own noose, I mean his own head into the noose, audience thought that was a wonderful achievement, and Punch became a folk hero. Now, important point to remember is up, up until this time, the shows were never written down. Once an entertainer learned a show, uh, he learned how to present it, he uh, passed that knowledge on to either his son or an apprentice. And in many respects, that's how that tradition continues to this day. Matter of fact, that's exactly how I learned the show, which you'll hear about a little bit later. The structure of the play, however, became formally established in 1828 when the first recorded script was captured in a book called The uh, Tragical Comedy or Comic, uh, Comical Tragedy of Punch and Judy. It was written by a journalist, John Payne Collier, and the book had wonderful illustrations by George Cruikshank. And I actually have some of those that are on display here. Through text and drawings, the, bu the book captured a performance of yet another uh, Italian showman, Giovanni Puccini. The book was later reprinted, adapted, and expanded countless times. In fact, versions of that book are still reprinted to this day. Now, a few interesting things about the performer and the author. Okay. That's one of the uh, Cruikshank drawings. Uh, Puccini was one of the best-known punchmen of the period. 
For nearly 50 years, he had been amusing lords, dukes, princesses, squires, and vagabonds throughout England. And it was said that everyone knew him and they would stop and watch his show. As for John Payne Collier, some of his works were labeled forgeries. And toward the end of his life, he more or less admitted that everything about his life had been a lie. Now, there's no doubt that parts of the Pacini script were embellished. It was a very ver verbose script. It could never be said with Mr. Punch speaking all those words through a swazzle. However, whatever the arguments are about Collier's honesty, it is still felt that that publication is what the French call a denouement, a turning point, because it provided a foundation for everything else that followed. All right. Now here is a typical Punch and Judy show from Puccini's time. This is uh, Punch on May Day, 1829, and this painting belongs to the Tate Gallery in London. Several uh, interesting things happened between the mid to, uh, uh, mid to late 1800s. The railways came about, and eventually they started making uh, excursions to the seaside. With a greater number of people now able to travel to the beach, masses of people started traveling there, and soon Punch and Judy followed them, along with the prenologists, oyster vendors, quack doctors, and donkey rides. So while, while uh, you were taking so while you were taking a paddle in the ocean, you could now watch a live Punch and Judy show. In the very early days, Punch and Judy shows were originally attended, or intended for uh, adult audiences because they were the ones that were paying to watch the show. Things started to change, though, during the Victorian times. The Victorians began to invite Punch and Judy men into their parlors to entertain middle-class drawing rooms and at children's parties. This is uh, circa 1850. Because of this, the street showmen started to clean up their acts, so to speak. And so Punch and Judy's image began to soften and slowly evolve into acceptable family entertainment. During these Victorian times, puppet characters were still being added and deleted. About 1860, the crocodile, one of the more exciting characters in the show, first appeared, and he's been in the show ever since. I thought you'd like this. This is a great one. Yeah, you'll notice there's a dog sitting up on the playboard. And, and a dog is, um, uh, he was occasionally seen in some performances. Um, in today's show, it's usually his, he's a, just a puppet. But back then, he did appear in some shows. And usually it was a small terrier, and it was, uh, belonged to the showman. It was his pet, and he would travel with him from town to town. The dog was always called Toby, and it wore a colorful ruff around its neck and sat on the playboard during the sequences. Mr. Punch would get the dog to stand up on its two hind legs, and at times the dog would get into a fight with Punch and bite his nose. I mean, bite his nose. Now, it is interesting, a couple um, before when I was coming in, somebody was talking to me about the dog, and this is true, that some of the dogs would actually smoke a pipe <laughs> or a cigarette. And um, anyway, but today you, you rarely see a live dog, although you will see a, a dog puppet in shows. Now, there's a reason why I included this. <laughs> this is what's known as a saucy seaside British postcard. I needed to get your attention so that you would remember three important things about Punch and Judy. And here they are. Joey the Clown, a slapstick, and audience participation. These three elements came about through a unique form of British entertainment called pantomimes, or pantos for short. Pantomimes are unique to England, and they have nothing to do with mimes. They are outlandish musicals based on well-known uh, children's stories, such as Peter Pan, Jack and the Beanstalk, Sleeping Beauty, etc. This type of entertainment has been taking place in England for several hundred years and always takes place around Christmas time. There was a famous English actor, a comedian known as Joseph Grimaldi. He played the part of a clown and he was so popular in these pantomimes that Punch and Judy men added him into their shows. In fact, clowns today are still known as Joey's and that's in honor of Joseph Grimaldi. Grimaldi and other characters in the pantomime used to hit each other with a wooden slapstick, which is two pieces of wood that when they hit together, they make a slapping noise 
without causing any real pain. In fact, this is where the word slapstick comedy comes from. So Punch and Judy performers added slapstick comedy, I mean the slapstick to their shows. And finally, the most important part taken from British pantomimes is the audience participation. If you were in England today attending, a, a, or around Christmas time, attending a British pantomime, and a character said, oh, no, I didn't, the entire audience would automatically respond and say, oh, yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Somebody has been there. <laughs> it's just a theatrical tradition. It's been handed down from generation to generation. When, they, when the bad guy comes out, everybody just <laughs> boos. I mean, it's, it's a sight to see, and it really is. Over in England, uh, Punch and Judy is probably more popular now than it's ever been. It's estimated that there are about 300 Punch and Judy performers in England. I would say here in America, we're lucky if we have about 50, you know. Now, I've jumped around a bit, and there's a, um, but I've given you a general overview of Punch and Judy in England. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about America. We know that Punch was here at least by 1742. A Philadelphia newspaper advertisement at, uh, announced the performance of Punch and Joan. See, didn't evolve yet. Since the notice said the figures were two feet high, I think it's safe to say that they were marionettes. Uh, not that long ago, I discovered a 1902 book called Maryland as a Palatinate. And it notes that there was a Punch and Judy show in Annapolis, Maryland, before the American Revolutionary War. Per his own accounting records, George Washington pur purchased the ticket to a Punch and Judy show. It wasn't long before these uh, Punch and Judy shows began popping up like mushrooms after a good rainstorm. Right after John Payne Collier's uh, book was released in England in 1828, unauthorized editions began, uh, be, were sold here. Let's see what do we got here? Okay. Now, if you have an interest in Punch and Judy in America, I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's written by uh, Ryan Howard. It's Punch and Judy in 19th Century America. Uh, Mr. Howard is a professor emeritus of art history at Moreland State University. Years back, I was in the early stages of writing a book about the history of Punch and Judy in America when Mr. Howard contacted me, and I told him that I was writing a book on the same subject. Since he already had a 15-year head start, <laughs> I thought it was a good idea to just work with him on the project. I think my wife was happy about that, too. But uh, truth be told, Mr. Howard had already completed a tremendous amount of work or research on Punch and Judy in the United States. At one time, there, and this is true, at one, all of this is true. I mean, <laughs> why would it not be true? <laughs> I have a bad habit of saying that. This is true. I don't know why I do that. At one time, there were hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of Punch and Judy shows uh, barnstorming across America. Some performers emigrated from England and other European countries. Most Punch and Judy performers were not full-time entertainers. Many were part-time magicians, ventriloquists, and they learned how to perform Punch and Judy from other Punch and Judy performers. And I'm sure some operators did what they had to do in order to make a living. Because of the diverse American population at the time, many of the early punch shows uh, included racial and ethnic characters, dialect, and humor. So where did all these shows take place in America? They were everywhere. They were performed at parks, fairs, theaters, and some venues that no longer exist. As an example, in the uh, late 1800s, some Punch and Judy shows were seen in concert saloons, which were low-class drinking establishments that provided cheap entertainment and female companionship to attract customers. There were also variety theaters. The majority of Punch and Judy show performers, however, found employment at circus sideshows, dime museums, and the Chautauqua circuit. Okay, ha, 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 here we go. This is probably one of the most famous Punch and Judy performers, uh, performers to work si circus sideshows, and it was none other than the legendary Harry Houdini. Of course, he was very young at the time, 
and this is when he was with the Welsh brother Circus, circus uh, circa 1895. It was said that Houdini carved his own Punch and Judy puppets. Now, at about sometime during the 1970s, I guess it was about 1975, I had a phone call, and someone was talking to me about these puppets. They either had them, they knew where they were, or they were selling them. But I wasn't performing Punch and Judy back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wish I could remember more, but I don't, I don't know how much you can remember from phone calls you know, from, you know, 40, 50 years ago. You know. Dime museums were popular institutions in the U.S. and by the late 1800s. They were designed as centers of, uh, for entertainment and moral education for the working class. P.T. Barnum opened the Dime Museum in New York back in 1842. Eventually, some of the museums featured Punch and Judy shows along with other types of variety entertainment. The picture here is Gus White. He's from Orange County, New York. And while he performed at many county fairs, he also performed for, uh, for years at museums, some of which were dime museums. He was on a circuit and traveled to Boston, Cleveland, Coney Island, and many other places. Now, I mentioned before that uh, most Punch and Judy performers also did other things to make a living. Gus White was an exceptional artist and made a decent living as a sign painter. You should also note that he was also an expert wood carver, and he made all his own puppets. And just look at some of the expressions on the faces of those puppets. And at one time, he had 32 characters that he could inject into his show at any given time. Since he was an amazing artist, one of his features was having Punch come up on stage with a notepad and a crayon, and they would sketch out an image of the president or someone from the audience. About 23 of his puppets survived, and they were auctioned off in 1992. Uh, a New York a comic collector bought them for $45,000. Okay. Then came Chautauqua. This was a big adult education movement from the late 1800s to the mid-late uh, 1920s. Chautauqua assemblies brought in all types of speakers, teachers, musicians, and entertainers. Their main purpose was to bring entertainment, education, and culture into communities across America. This is a picture of Professor Will Smith. He was originally from England, and he came from a long line of Punch and Judy performers. In 1921, he was performing at a Chautauqua event in Talbot County, Maryland. I'll admit he looks a, a bit scary dressed as Mr. Punch. You know. This next performer came later, but there's a reason why I'm highlighting him. His name is George Prentice. His real name was Michael Zilka, and he is considered a legend in the annals of Punch and Judy history. Even till today, the Punch and Judy professors over in England still talk about him as if he were a god. He performed in vaudeville, and between 1931 and 1932, he performed 231 Punch and Judy shows on Broadway in a play called Laugh Parade that starred comedian Ed Wynn. In 1934, he was invited to entertain the Duke of Windsor at his royal wedding party. Can you imagine that? He stayed in England and performed it for two years. Some of his performances were at the prestigious London Palladium. After appearing in another Broadway show, he toured uh, Europe for six years. His list of accomplishments just go on and on. He entertained the servicemen at, at USO camps during World War II. He performed in Vegas, many popular shows of the day. The man was everywhere. One of his most prestigious bookings was performing Punch and Judy at Radio City Music Hall. That's a 6,200 seat theater. One reviewer said his puppets were a little hard to see. <laughs> but his comedy was universal. It got laughs practically all the way. So you might ask, how did I become interested in Punch and Judy? And if you don't ask that, I'll ask it. Okay. It actually it dates back to, it's kind of weird, but it, it actually goes back to 1897 in Baltimore. This is a, a photo here, a 1940 photo of James Edward Ross. He was known as Professor Rosella. 
and he first performed at Pat Harris's Dye Museum in Baltimore in 1897. He would later go on to perform his show at Young's Million Dollar Pier in Atlantic City, and for years he was featured, he was a featured attraction at a now defunct Baltimore amusement park called Riverview. One of his greatest testimonials came from President Theodore Roosevelt after watching one of his performances. Per Mrs. Roosevelt, the president enjoyed Rosella's Punch and Judy show more than any child in the audience. So again, how did I become interested in Punch and Judy? This is a picture of George Horn when he was a young magician. He was a ventriloquist, and he met Rosella. In fact, he was a frequent visitor to, to Riverview Amusement Park, where he watched Rosella perform the show. And uh, George Horn performed the show in Baltimore for nearly 60 years. One of his strangest bookings, George Horn's bookings, was behind a two-way mirror at a swanky nightclub in Baltimore called Club Charles. The audience never saw George Horn, and he worked there every night for six, night, for six years. His Punch and Judy puppets would interact with audience members, play musical instruments, and again, all behind a two-way mirror. If, if, a reg, if a regular person came in, or, I mean a regular came in with a new lady friend, one of the puppets would say, hey, Joe, that's not the same lady you brought in here the other night. <laughs> and all the bar flies would laugh. You know? So when I was about 10 years old, I saw George Horn perform Punch and Judy, and I never forgot it, or his name. And as a child, I remember calling him up on the phone and telling him that I was going to visit him. And I did 20, 25 years later. Although I was performing as a magician, I, st I hired him to entertain at my niece's birthday party. And the children's reaction to that show was amazing. It was unlike anything I had ever heard before. He was in his late 80s, and since his wife had died, we just became good friends. And for years, I visited him once a month and would always take him out to dinner. In a nice way, I told him I'd like to take over the show if he ever decided that he wanted to retire. And then one day, he called me up and told me that. I studied under him for years and was a pallbearer at his funeral. And he died at the age of 98. And for a while, I actually thought he was going to outlive me. Uh, as, as of this year, I've been performing a modified version of the Rosella Horn Show under the banner of Professor Horn for 25 years. And that's my story. Thank you. <laughs> So, 